All right, hey, everybody who's here in the auditorium, can you help me give an official welcome to all of our friends who are online? Come on, put your hands together. God bless you guys. Those of you in our church family who haven't yet ventured back to church, man, it's good to have you guys on board as well as all the guests who are watching. And man, I'm so excited you guys are here. We are wrapping up a series today. Before we dive in, you know, last week I had uh, the opportunity to fly to Atlanta uh, for the day. And uh, I don't particularly like flying. I don't like the security and all that. But due to the present environment, can I tell you, it was just a breeze going through security. There are like two people ahead of me in the entire uh, security line at the Orlando International Airport. It was smooth sailing. And when I got to my gate, I was there waiting, you know, to board my plane. I was plenty early. And I heard that announcement that others of us have probably heard various times when we've been traveling by air. And that is that there was an announcement that the plane was going to be delayed because the plane was having some mechanical difficulties. Now, it wasn't my plane. I heard the announcement from the gate that was right next to my plane. And as they made this announcement, I was observing what was going on over there. And by the way, whenever I hear that, and let's just say it was for my plane, that, hey, our plane's delayed because of some mechanical problems. Can I just tell you that I have no problem with that? I'm like, guys, take all the time you need. You know what I'm saying? Just make sure that that thing's working properly if we're going to go, you know, 30,000 feet in the air. So uh, I'm watching what's happening over there. And when they made that announcement about the delay, I saw this lady who just got so upset. She was like, oh, man. And she was flopping all over the place. Like a little kid when their body stops working, when they're frustrated, you know, just flopping around. She She was all upset. It was really kind of interesting. And then they said... Later, we're sorry, but this particular plane is not going to be able to uh, be ready. So we've called another plane to come, and we're going to change your gate. And that lady lost her mind. I mean, she was just flipping out, so upset that she was inconvenienced. And what's crazy was the gate that they opened, that they changed it to, was the gate right next to hers. She had to take an entire 10 steps farther to the other gate. And she was just, just so upset. Now, that was kind of an over-the-top response to see this lady doing this. But, but the fact is, it's kind of indicative of something that all of us struggle with. You know, any time we're confronted with changes, it can be hard. Right? It can be frustrating when we're asked to wait or our plans are altered in some way. It can be frustrating. It can be difficult. This whole idea of delay or change can be challenging for all of us. My dad is famous for saying that nobody likes change. The only people who like change are babies with dirty diapers, all right? Really deep truth from my dad that he brought me up with, but it really is true. We really don't like change. We're going to talk about change a little bit today in terms of how God wants to use this in our lives and in our, the fulfillment of our mission here at Life Church. But how many of you remember, each week of this series, I've been sharing with you our church's mission. Alan said it earlier, but how many of you can say out loud, you remember that one sentence that kind of incorporates our, uh, encapsulates our mission here at Life Church? How many of you can see it? I'm going to start it. Let's see if you can finish it nice and loud. Helping. Oh, that's awesome. Helping people find and follow Jesus. It does my heart good that so many of you remember that, all right? So that's our mission, to help people find and follow Jesus. Now, as a church, we've had to deal and flex and adjust to this whole pandemic season, but this crisis has never defined our vision. That's why the very first Sunday back, we just want to get right back to our mission, right back to our vision, and keep in focus what God has called us to do and who he's called us to be as a church. And we've also, in this series, been breaking down our church's values. Now, our mission is what we're called to do. Our values are how we go about fulfilling that mission. And really, what this series has been, has been a rollout and an unpacking of our church's values. So there are eight values. I've already shared six of them with you. We've been doing two each week, but let's just review them real quickly. First of all, we talked about how we fulfill our mission of helping people find and follow Jesus by, first of all, rejecting religion. And religion is God uh, or man's man-made rules that you have to fulfill in order to gain and earn God's approval and acceptance. So we reject religion And instead, second value is we're all about encountering Jesus. 
All right, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. It's about walking in faith with Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for us. Thirdly, in this mission, we all have a part to play. So the third value is that we each do our part. And we each, in our community here in a local church, we understand that we have a ministry that God has given us, a way that we can serve God by serving each other. So we all have a part to play. Fourthly, we talked about growing in generosity. It's also how we fulfill our mission, is that God begins to expand our hearts. We begin to understand that, man, everything that God has blessed us with is not just for us, but he wants us to have enough and then more than enough so that we can be a blessing to others and a blessing to God's kingdom work here on earth through our local church. We talked about this uh, fifth value, which is to live lights on, windows open. And what that's about is that, you know what, no religious masks, no outward pretense, no trying to push out an image that we got everything all together, but we want to be a church where we can be real and open and transparent and talk about our struggles, talk about our fears, talk about the challenges in our lives, deal with even the, the sins and, and things that, that are trying to hold us back spiritually, and we can encourage and pray for each other. It's just all about the value of being real and transparent. And then uh, we talked about this sixth one, which is connecting in community. So living lights on windows open is what helps us grow and live in authentic community and in heart deep types of relationships in a church family. But today I'm going to give you the last two, okay? Here are the the two we're going to talk about today, and that is that to fulfill our mission of helping people find and follow Jesus, we embrace change. Everybody say embrace change, okay? Embrace change. That means change is a good thing. Even though we may not like it, change is a good thing, and then we also reveal the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to explain that, but these two really go together. The way that we reveal the kingdom of God, part of that is embracing change. And so, uh, as we look at these values and as we, as we break them down, this whole idea of change is kind of our, our focus today. And we need to understand that it's essential to who we are as a, as a local church and what God has called us to do uh, and be, and it's what enables us to help people find and follow Jesus. Now, none of us like change, but change is necessary for our growth. Here's an important truth. If you want to write this down, if you're taking notes, that healthy things grow and growth produces change. Healthy things grow and growth produces change. For years, my son, Brandon, when he would come home from school as a, as a little kid, he goes, hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. He'd just come home with that squeaky little voice. Hi, Dad. And then one day, I don't know what happened, he comes home from school and was like, hi, Dad. It's like James Earl Jones moved into our living room. Like, who is saying hi, Dad? And all of a sudden, his voice dropped like two octaves. And it was just a reminder that with growth comes change. And when Jesus described the kingdom of God, which is we're here to reveal the God's kingdom, it's interesting that he always described it in terms of something that grows. It's really fascinating. Here's an example in Mark. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the tiniest seed you can sow. But after that seed is planted, it grows into the largest plant in the garden, a plant so big that birds can build their nests in the shade of its branches. So he talks about the kingdom as being something like a seed that that grows. And so growth is a part. Now, as we said, growing things are going to change. And that's often where we're challenged. In fact, we see an example of this throughout, many examples of this throughout the book of Acts. But here's one in Acts chapter 2. Peter was pleading and, and offering many logical reasons to believe Whoever made a place for his message in their hearts received the baptism. In fact, that day alone, about 3,000 people joined the disciples. All right, so in one day, this was the day the church was birthed, on the day of Pentecost. Today is Pentecost Sunday, interestingly enough. And so on, on this day in history, many years ago, Peter, as the Holy Spirit was poured out, and uh, Peter began preaching, 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus. From from this little group of people, immediately they were this mega church 
All right, so do you think that created any changes for that church community? I think there were probably some camel parking issues the next Sunday when they got together uh, to meet. In fact, when you read through Acts, you'll see as the church grew, it created problems. And they had to flex and change in order to address those problems. And as they did, there was continued growth. And then there were new problems that they had to deal with. And, and it's just a truth that with growth is change. And then one of the nature, uh, uh, natural factors related to the kingdom of God is this whole idea of growth and change that are a part. So we need to just acknowledge the fact that change, though it's necessary, makes us uncomfortable. None of us like it. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but God is often very comfortable with my discomfort. He's, he's not at all, you know, doesn't have any problem with allowing me to walk into some difficult situations at times that challenge me to change for the sake of my growth. Now, he's right there with me. He doesn't leave me. In fact, he'll comfort me in the midst of my discomfort, but he'll let me go into those uncomfortable moments in order to do a work in my life. Now, as a church, this is, this is true as well. That, you know, when, when changes come, when the church grows, changes inevitably come, and it, and it causes us sometimes to be uncomfortable. You know, when a church is really growing, uh, you can't necessarily always park where you're used to parking because there's all these new people parking in your place. You know, you can't always sit in the seat, in that pew that it, you feel like is your pew and your seat because a new person who doesn't know well, as the church is growing is going to come and they're going to sit in your pew and they have no idea that that's the only place in the building that Jesus can actually speak to you. And that's like your holy little spot right there. And all these new, and so there's all kinds of inconveniences. There's all kinds of things that come with, with growth. And we just need to acknowledge that this is very true personally, is that God to help us grow will allow us to endure seasons of change. And so, uh, it, at Life Church, just, just considering our church, since this is one of our values, this church, Life Church, has existed, though these buildings are much older. Life Church has been around for about 14 years. Over these 14 years, there have been significant seasons of change in this church over those 14 years. Just in the six years, this past October, that Gene and I have, have been assigned here as the lead pastors, there's been a lot of change that has taken place just over the six years that, that, that we have been here. And we need to understand and just embrace, everybody say embrace, okay? Embrace means it's okay with the fact that there's always going to be change. People change, leaders change. Programs change, strategies change, styles change, service times change. There's always going to be change. And if we will embrace change, God can use changes to do something very good in our lives personally as well as our church. So we embrace change because healthy things grow and growth produces change. Now, when it comes to our life as a church, we need to re be reminded that methods are flexible. But biblical truth is enduring, right? Now, over the thousands of years of church history that we've had so far, there's been a lot of changes in terms of style and methods. You can look at it different ways of, of how the early church operated and how throughout history there have been changes to that. There have been differences in worship style and approach to what happens in, in the service context. And this has happened throughout history. You know, one of the areas that challenges people when it comes to change is in the area of music because everybody has their own preferences, right? And you'll never make everybody happy when it comes to music, when it comes to style. But throughout church history, there's been so many different styles, People who have grown up in church, maybe for the most part, probably had a season of time where they sing songs to God out of a hymnal when they're in church. How many of you grew up singing hymns in church as, as a youngster, okay? A few of you have. You know what I'm talking about. And sometimes those who have that in their background will have that as their preference in worship style. They feel like that, man, that's the most spiritual way. That's what the kind of worship God loves when I sing out of a hymnal. But others of you don't have that background. 
And so everyone has different opinions. Everyone has different preferences. And what we need to be careful of is making our preference divine. This is the only way to do it for God to be pleased. This is the only truly spiritual way to worship or to do things. This is true of church services as well. Now, many of you know this, but if you visit 10 churches in this community, you will discover 10 different styles of worship. Have you noticed that? No two churches are exactly alike. And that diversity, I believe, is good. It's a healthy thing. No two churches have the same style. Some churches, when they're singing and even during the preaching, there's a lot of yelling and jumping and rolling and kneeling and laying on the floor, swinging from the light fixtures, you know, the, the, the you know, aerobics for Jesus types churches, right? And the preacher's not preaching unless he's sweating. And, and it's not really a good service unless people are shouting and screaming and waving their handkerchiefs. How many of you know those kind of churches that I'm talking about, okay? Nothing wrong with that worship style. There are also churches where it's really quiet. And their, you know, key verses, be still and know that I am God. And they're very reverent. And they don't do anything unless it's written down in the order of service. And it's very organized and quiet. And that's their style of worship. And they enjoy that style of worship. And then you have all the different styles in between. So the question is, who's right? Who's more spiritual? Who, whose style and approach to worship is more pleasing to God? And I would suggest to you that God isn't really concerned about style, and he's not really concerned about um, methodology. He's concerned about what's going on in our heart when we're worshiping. Right? Jesus said it this way, that, that true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In other words, they focus their worship based on the truth of the word of God, and it's in spirit. In other words, it's from the heart. It's sincere. It's a sincere communication of our heart to God. The methodology, the style, the types of songs are really not the major issue. It just needs to be based on truth of the scripture and from our heart, and that's the type of worship that pleases God. And so again, we make such a big deal about generational changes over time, cultural changes that happen in society that influence the, a church's style and approach to worship. But see, God's looking at the heart. If you go to other countries, you'll see totally different styles and approaches uh, to worship. And so I say all that to say, we can't get hung up on methods because methods can and should change. Each local church is unique in the way they approach those types of things. But we just need to be open and flexible and willing to change. Just dealing with, with the, the singing part, Psalm 96 and verse 1 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Some people don't like that modern kind of worship. I much prefer the old hymns and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with loving and appreciating uh, the, the music of, of previous generations. Not that the old is bad, but it seems the scripture is saying that there's great value in fresh expressions of worship to God in each generation, in different moments, in different responses to creativity and, and artistic expression. It's a good thing. Now, by the way, this isn't the only place this is talked about in scripture. Here's a few other places where it's mentioned. Psalm 33, verse 3. Sing a new song of praise to him. Psalm 40, verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth. Psalm 98, verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Psalm 144, verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, my God. Psalm 149, verse 1. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Isaiah 42, verse 10, sing to the Lord a new song. You guessed it. Very good. Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song. Revelation 14, 3, and they sang a new song before the throne. Can you guys see that there's a little bit of a theme here? All right? That a fresh expression 
of worship to God is a good thing. And so we got to just be able to be, be open to, to change and creativity and generational changes. Some things that may not be our cup of tea, thank God we can go find the worship style that we grew up with, that we prefer. We can enjoy that all week. Then come together and enjoy kind of a new style that may be fitting to a particular generation. See, so styles change. Methods change. So we don't want to get attached to those things. But we want to anchor our lives in the truth. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6. Because I am the eternal one, what does he say? I never change. So God doesn't change. Because of this, our methods are flexible, but the truth never changes. See, we don't change what we believe in order to adapt to our culture. We stand on God's timeless truths. What's right has always been right, and what's wrong has always been wrong. What's right will always be right, and what's wrong will always be wrong. These are timeless truths. They are absolutes that we can build our life on. So God has called us to be salt and light. He's called us to be mixed into our culture and to be in the world and not of the world. So being in the world means that we're able to connect with people where they work, where they play, where they live, with their styles, with the, the certain um, um, cultural trappings of communication, and we can leverage those things to communicate the truth. Paul said, I've become all things to all men that I might win some. And so we're open to changes in methodology to connect with people, but God's truth never changes. And even though God's truth never changes, he's always doing something new. And again, this is the part that makes us uncomfortable, but it really always is for our good. Look at Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 43. This is a good one for us to read out loud. Come on, you guys are doing good. Read it nice and loud with me. Come on. Don't revel only in the past or spend all your time recounting the victories of days gone by. Watch closely. I am preparing something new. It's happening now, even as I speak, and you're about to see it. I'm preparing a way through the desert. Waters will flow where there had been none. And so we see here that Jesus is talking about this new thing. And what he's talking about is the kingdom of God. Now, because the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day and many people, you know, Jesus wasn't their style. He didn't fit their program or their concepts. Um, Jesus made people very, very uncomfortable. But he's saying, listen, I'm wanting to do a new thing. And this is based on, on God's plan. Now, what does he mean by the kingdom of God? Let's take a minute with that one. Now, are we talking the kingdom? Are we talking about some type of Game of Thrones type of thing here? No. The kingdom of God is very simply this. If you want to just write it down as a definition, the kingdom of God is where what God wants done is done. All right, that's the kingdom of God, where what God wants done is done. God's way of doing things is done. That's the kingdom of God. So we live in a world full of pain, brokenness, violence, injustice, racism, right? But none of this is God's intent for mankind. It's all the result of our rebellion against God. And Jesus came to establish God's kingdom, God's way of doing things, and what he wants done. He came to establish that in the hearts of men and women. And he wants to establish forgiveness and healing and love and joy and peace and unity and healing of brokenness. These are all aspects of the kingdom of God. It's what God wants done and how he wants things done. And what he does is he, he wants to do that work in our lives. And then those of us who are Jesus followers... He calls us to communicate those values to our culture, invite other people to experience what God wants to do in their lives. Now, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. And we can see, again, an example of that here in Matthew 4. It says, and Jesus went through Galilee. 
He taught in the synagogues. He preached the good news of the kingdom, and he healed people, ridding their bodies of sickness and disease. Now, it's interesting that Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom, and he healed people. And we see many examples of him doing that. He'd preach the kingdom, and then he would heal people and cast out devils and do all these amazing miracles. And the reason he attached those miraculous works to the preaching of the kingdom, he's saying, guys, here is an example of what God wants and how he wants things done. God never intended for you to be bound by darkness. So I'm going to release people from darkness. God never intended for you to deal with sick bodies. So as I'm talking about the kingdoms, the kingdom of God, I'm going to heal sick bodies. God never intended for people to live in brokenness, so, so I want to bring healing to the brokenhearted. So he attached his miracles to the teaching of the kingdom because these are illustrations of what God's heart is and his heart for the brokenness of mankind. And he has called every Christ follower to reveal his heart, to reveal his kingdom to this world so that they can see what God's heart is and what he truly wants for mankind. Now, how do I reveal the kingdom of God? A couple of quick steps. The first is to become a citizen of the kingdom of God. We can never reveal the kingdom until we ourselves become a citizen. Well, how do you become a citizen? Jesus talked about this in the book of John, chapter 3. Jesus replied to this guy named Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus was an older guy. He was very confused by this. He thought Jesus was speaking literally. So it's like, dude, you're saying I got to kind of go back into my mom's womb and be born again? What are you talking about born again? And Jesus was trying to say, no, this is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. And the only way to enter the kingdom of God, to become a citizen of God's kingdom, is to be spiritually born again. And the way that that happens is for us to put our faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross for us. It's not joining the church, not going through classes, not attending every Sunday. You don't become a citizen of the kingdom by shaking the preacher's hand or even being baptized. It's by being born again through faith in Jesus Christ. So we'll never reveal the kingdom until we're a citizen of God's kingdom and transformed from the inside out. The second way we reveal the kingdom is to commit to ongoing renewal and repentance. Commit to ongoing renewal and repentance. See, the way I reflect God's kingdom is that I embrace the changes that God wants to make in my life and in my lifestyle. It's embracing the fact that, you know what, I'm recognizing my sin, I'm recognizing my dysfunction, I'm recognizing these areas that my life don't, doesn't please God. And God, as you show me those things, I want to repent, and I want you to renew me, and I want to follow your way from now on. That's the lifestyle of the citizen of God's kingdom. Now, guys, I just want to be honest with you, totally transparent. I thought that by now, by 55 years old, I would be at a place where I have most things figured out. I thought that by now in my life, I would be done with making really dumb decisions. But as it turns out, apparently I need a bit more time. Because the more I learn, the more I understand that I don't know. And the more I grow, the more areas that God shows me that, hey, here's another area that you can grow in. Here's another area that you can grow in. And I find that I still have to repent on a regular basis. Now, what does that word repentance mean? It simply means to have been walking with this direction. Repent means to turn my direction, turn my back on that, and go with God in this direction. And repentance and renewal is an ongoing lifestyle for those who are following Jesus, those who are citizens of God's kingdom. All right, God, I blew that. Please forgive me. Help me to do better. Over and over and over again. That prayer, over and over again. In fact, one of the indicators of spiritual maturity is that I repent quicker now than I used to. 
I'm more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I'm more sensitive to that still small voice that's kind of correcting and guiding me. That means I'm getting closer to God. Is that I realize even more the areas that I need to change and repent. So this is, again, how the citizen of heaven lives. And I reveal God's kingdom, and I help people find and follow Jesus by living that way, becoming a citizen of heaven through faith, by embracing uh, renewal and change, which is the lifestyle of the citizen of heaven, and then thirdly, extending the invitation to others. Extending the invitation to become a citizen of God's kingdom to others. Now, when I was a young pastor, I found a statistic that greatly challenged me. And in fact, this particular statistics by a guy named George Barna, who's like the Gallup poll of spiritual trends in America, he came up with this, this, or revealed this statistic that as a young youth pastor really challenged me and it really motivated me to end up, Gene and I, planting two churches from scratch, like out of our living room. And here was the uh, statistic that 98% of church growth in America is transfer growth. Now, what does that mean? Transfer growth is when people leave, they're a Christian, they're a Christ follower, and they leave church A, and they start attending the new hip and happen in church B on the other side of town. Or they attend church A, and someone hurts their feelings or disappoints them in some way, and so they leave that church and they go to the other church in town. And of course, as other people go to that other church in town, that church grows. And what this statistic is saying is that 98 of church growth in, percent of church growth in America is not church growth at all. It's just population shifts. It's people who are already believers, and they're just going to different churches based on different seasons and trends uh, in our country. Only 2% of church growth in America is actually people who were lost and are coming to faith in Jesus Christ for the first time or the first time in a long time. Only 2%. In fact, Barna reveals that it's actually less than 2% because within that 2% is actually babies being born in churches. So it's less than 2% of, of church growth in America is actually people finding Jesus beginning a relationship with him. And folks, this is our assignment. This is the great commission. Jesus said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Share my love. Shine my light. Reveal the kingdom to people who are lost in darkness. And folks, this is a driving value of our church. The first half of our mission, 50% of it, is helping people find. Helping people find. And this is a value that, that we take very seriously. And it ener energizes much of our, half of our church's effort and focus because it's what God has called us to do. And beyond our church life, this is what God has called every Christ follower to do. In some way and in some form, helping influence other people to themselves come to faith in Jesus Christ. We do this through our words. We do this the way, through the way we live our lives. We do this by simply talking about, you know, the changes that God is making in our life. We do this by extending an invitation to somebody to join us for a church service. There's so many different ways. But see, God wants to use us in the midst of the pain that we see in our world to be carriers of his light and to share that invitation to be a part of God's kingdom. In fact, the ultimate of what God intends is found in Revelation 21. It says, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's ultimately what God wants. And see, God wants us to give the world a taste of what heaven will be like. We can't do it perfectly because this isn't heaven yet. But see, God wants the church to be a reflection of his heart. So when we look at what's happening in the world, the, the, the 
conflict and the violence and the hatred and the injustice. He wants the church to be that community where people can see what, what God's value system is. See, when, when we see racial injustice and, and hatred and all that, the church should be the last place where those types of things are found. Can somebody say amen in this quiet little church today, okay? Yeah, this is where we say to the world, this is what God wants. We, we encourage each other, we stand together, we walk in unity, we love one another, we serve each other's needs. And you know what? It's a good thing for us from time to time, regardless of the reasons that we may motivate it, but to look into our hearts and say, you know what? Is there in me any type of prejudicial or racist attitudes in my life? Because I want you to know, guys, completely inconsistent with the values of God's kingdom. He wants to see each other the way he sees us. That when we see a brother or a sister, we see another person, we see them as a soul that Jesus died for. And that we walk in love, we walk in unity, and it's a person that is of indescribable value to God. And we are the ones to, to reflect that. Here's the problem. When the world visits many churches, they don't see a whole lot of difference in the church than they're seeing out in the world. And the church, in many cases, unfortunately, can lose its saltiness and lose its light, and that light can grow dim. You go to some churches, and there's conflict, and people judging each other, uh, having their little cliques, their little groups, the in crowd and the out crowd. Let me tell you something. That should be foreign to the life of God's kingdom people. I'm thankful to say all of those things are foreign to the life of Life Church, and we should just give God praise for that today because we don't, we don't live that way as God's people. So we're the carriers of that light, and as Jesus followers, embracing change and revealing God's kingdom are inseparable values. We, as Jesus followers, should be in the forefront of championing change in our world. It starts right here, but it was never meant to stay right here. It's to be a light that we shine everywhere we go. So church should be the model of what can and should be different in the world. And my question to you is, are you all in? Have you put all your chips in the middle of the table so you know what, God? I want to be that type of church. I want to be your light to this world. Let's pray together. Bow your heads with me, everybody. And as we close today, I want to invite you just to bow your heads, open your heart, and just, just make your heart your altar today. Question number one is, are you a citizen of heaven? And I'm not talking about do you attend church regularly or have you been baptized or did you shake the preacher's hand I'm asking, have you surrendered your heart to him? Have you put your faith in the finished work of the cross? If you realize you need to do that, you've never done it or it's been a very long time since you've said, Lord, I open my heart and my life to you. Just right now as we close, just pray a prayer in your heart that says, Lord, I want to truly be a citizen of your kingdom today. So come into my life, fill me with your spirit, forgive my sin, I believe today. I've decided to follow Jesus. Help me and teach me, Lord, and I will follow. That's the first step, just being a citizen of his kingdom. Those of us who already are citizens of God's kingdom, the question is, are you living like a citizen? Are you embracing repentance and renewal as a lifestyle? Are you open to the Holy Spirit Searching your life and your character. Allowing him to shine that spotlight on the areas that need to change in order to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. It's a heart that's cooperative, that's humble, that says, Lord, as you teach me, as you show me, God, I'm going to change. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to repent. I'm going to trust you and your power to work out those changes on the inside of me. Guys, let me ask you, what's your attitude towards change? 
Do you have a growth mindset? Because we are challenged with change in our lives, we can either get you know, frustrated and complain about those changes like the lady in the airport. Or can, we can say, Lord, what is it that you want to teach me through this season in my life? A growth mindset. Lord, through the changes, through the adjustments that I'm being asked to make, how do you want to do a work in my life? And I, I open my heart to you. Last question. Is anyone going to be in heaven because of you? Are you being a carrier of his light, a revealer of his kingdom to the people in your life around you who are still in darkness? God doesn't want you to become some type of Bible thumper and yelling at people and confronting people. He just wants you to reflect his light. Demonstrate his love. Demonstrate his values. Be willing to share when those appropriate opportunities come. Be willing to kind of step out there and make an invitation to a church service sometime. To be willing to just pray for someone who's dealing with a struggle and offering that or letting them know that you're praying. Father, would you make us your hands and your feet would you teach us how to go about reflecting your kingdom? Especially in these very difficult times that we're living in right now. So we see the brokenness of our world and the pain and the, the, the violence and the injustice. Lord, we need you. Help us to be carriers of your light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together and just thank God for his love today?